So while we remain standing, if you turn with me to your Bibles, and if you can find a church Bible, it's on page 996. Um, but we're looking this morning in our series in 2 Timothy. We've got to chapter 2, and we're looking this morning at uh, verses 20 through to verse 26. And as I say, it's on page 996. And as you turn uh, to uh, the Bible, let me just um, recap, give you a sense of the story thus far. Think of it as uh, like the beginning of those Star Wars movies where there's the scroll of the story thus far. Here it is. So Paul was writing his last letter to Timothy. Paul knows that he's about to die. What is more, it is serious times for Christianity. One scholar called Bishop Moule, M-O-U-L-E, says that humanly speaking, Christianity was on the verge of annihilation. The reason for this is not only was the great Apostle Paul about to die, but also the Emperor, Emperor Nero, had taken it upon himself to try to stamp out Christianity. He thought it was just like one of those secret societies that he felt so threatened by. So the empire, the evil empire, (laughs) is against Christianity. What is more, Asia, where um, Paul, the province of Asia, where Paul had had such a fruitful ministry, had now, Paul says, all turned against him, that is, turned against gospel Christianity. Timothy is in Ephesus, the, in a way, the most significant church in that province of Asia, the, 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 the bridgehead to the, to the gospel going to the interior. And it all is going to hang on Timothy's shoulders, in a sense, humanly speaking. And yet Timothy, (laughs) Timothy is the most unlikely candidate for such a job. Uh, He's physically frail. He has frequent illnesses. You know, he may just not turn up to the office one day because he's sick. Plus, he's emotionally fragile. Or at least he's shy. We might say he's a pretty strong introvert in the sort of Myers-Briggs way of looking at life. And he's facing real challenges because, as the Apostle Paul predicted before he left, he did his farewell to the Ephesian elders in Acts. As the Apostle Paul predicted, actually, false teachers had risen up in the church and in the area. And so the Apostle Paul writes this letter to Timothy, telling him to be brave, to suffer along with Paul for the cause of the gospel. That's basically chapter 1. And then chapter 2, he presents to Timothy various pictures of how to do it. A soldier, an athlete, a farmer. In other words, it's going to be hard work, Timothy. You've got to be disciplined like an Olympic athlete. And then there's the picture of a workman. That is a skilled workman. You've got to really know your stuff. You've got to have skill, aptitude, and develop. Now we come to two other metaphors underneath an umbrella of one big metaphor, and that is of the house. And so I've called this sermon, Follow the House Rules. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and beginning at verse 20. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may escape from the snare of the devil 
after being captured by him to do his will. This is God's word. Amen. You may uh, grab your seats. So let me ask you this question. Do you long to do something significant? Something important? Something that you would be pleased to have written about you in an obituary after you die. I think all of us do. We're all made in the image of God and we all want to do something of value, of significance, whether at home, in our families, with our children, at work, in the political world, in the church world. We have this innate natural desire to do something of significance and to feel like our lives have counted. And that, I think, is why many of these popular TV programs about talents are so, uh, do so well these days. America's Got Talent. We want to be on the platform, as it were, whether physically here or in our lives, we want to be the kind of person who's doing something of value. But how do we do that? Maybe you feel like uh, the task that you've been called to is a little too big for you, as I think Timothy must have done. How on earth could he do all that Paul was asking him to do? Perhaps you look at your family and you wonder how you can fix this or that. Or maybe like Timothy, you're facing actual physical illness and yet God wants you to do something. How can you do it? Well, uh, says Paul to Timothy, I have a picture for you. It's a picture of a house. It's a great house. And, of course, what he means by this great house is the house of God, the church. And in this great house, there are certain ways of acting or thinking or being that means the master, the master of the house, the Lord Jesus, is going to use you. If you align yourself with those principles, those ways of thinking of being, The master will use you. He'll use you to be a part of his gospel purpose. Well, what are those things then, Paul, says Timothy? That sounds good. How do I align myself to those rules, if you like, those principles? What does that mean? Well, says uh, Paul to Timothy, I have two pictures for you of things that go on in this great house. One is of a vessel, an inanimate object, a thing, a container, a vessel. And he talks about that. And the other is of a servant, the most unlikely hero, the servant of a house. And so that's the structure of the sermon. First a vessel, then a servant. And it's all one big picture. We're going to explore this great house of God and how we can be used by the master of the house. So first, the vessel. This is verses 20 uh, to 22 in your passage. And you'll see there that Paul is describing basically two different kinds of vessels. Uh, There are vessels, says Paul, in a great house, and maybe when you think of a great house, you need to have in your mind something like um, Downton Abbey or something. Huge house. Buckingham Palace. (laughs) A great house. And you go to such a great house, says Paul, you'll notice that there are all kinds of different vessels, different containers In broad terms, says Paul, there are two different kinds. One is the expensive kind of container, the expensive kind of vessel. Gold and silver and 
made of some kind of precious metal, maybe with jewels encrusted into it. It's, it's a vessel that is set aside for a special purpose. It's set aside for the master's use, those kind of vessels. But then also, says Paul, there are other kinds of vessels. Those vessels are used, says Paul, for dishonorable purposes. And what does he mean by that? What he's thinking of the kitchen, maybe, or even the restroom. Uh, there are vessels you use for taking out the trash, other kinds of containers. And you see the picture. In the house, there are two different kinds of vessels or containers. One for dishonorable purpose, the other for honorable, special purpose. Now, what does Paul mean by these two different kinds of vessels? Well, almost certainly in the context, what he means is the gospel teacher and then the false teacher. One commentator puts it like this. By talking about dishonorable vessels, that is, vessels used for human waste and for garbage, most likely he's talking about the false teachers, Hymenaeus and Philetus. That's strong language. <laughs> Subtle language. He's not rude about it, but it's strong language. See, these false teachers, you can see in verse 18, right before our passage, you had the Bible open, were telling, that the, telling everyone that the resurrection has already happened. Now, we don't know anything really about their false teaching other than that simple phrase. Probably they were building upon Greek thought that found physical resurrection very hard to believe and therefore a spiritual future was more tenable or they were building upon some of the mystical ideas that were prevalent in the ancient world at the time, some kind of mystical experience, not the physical resurrection of Jesus that would lead to our physical resurrection and then eternity. That false teaching, says Paul, is going on in these vessels. But there are other kinds of vessels. Now, says Paul, Timothy, you want to be used by God. You want your life to matter and to count. You're thinking to yourself, how can I have the power of God within me as my vessel how can the master, as it were, fill me with his spirit so that I, as it were, contain his power and are used by God? Well, says Paul, there's a simple condition that the master has. There's only really one condition, these two different kinds of vessels. You must cleanse yourself from the dishonorable. In other words, the master's one condition, he wants to use you. He wants to use you for something significant and of value in your life as you bring up your children, as you look after your aged parents, as you go into politics or business, as you start your own company. He wants to use you, but there is one condition and only one condition, and that condition is that his vessels are clean. He wants clean vessels. What does it mean to have a clean vessel? Well, in context, what it means is to cleanse ourselves from the false teaching and the false teaching that led uh, to false uh, living. And of course, that idea of the resurrection having already happened is so prevalent also today, isn't it? The most common false teaching today, I think, in many ways is imagine a world where there is no heaven and no hell. It's easy if you can. And we're constantly bombarded with media, with Instagram posts, with YouTube clips that are saying all the time, live for now. There is no resurrection. Grab it while you can. Live now. We've got to cleanse our minds of that thought process. We've got to realize that actually Jesus is risen. And if we trust in him, we can have his power at work in our lives now and forever. 
You say, well, how do I do that? Well, Paul tells us. He says, so, flee the youthful passions and pursue faith, love, and peace along with those who call on God from a pure heart. In other words, there's a strong activity that needs to take place. In the power of Christ, we need to run away from youthful passions and pursue this faith, love, and peace along with those who call upon God with a pure heart. That is in the community of the church, in our small groups, in our adult communities, along with those who call on God with a pure heart. This, this cleanliness idea, this cleaning idea, clean vessel. So we encourage one another together. Flee the youthful passions. The youthful passions in context does not merely mean sexual immorality and that sort of thing. What it means is the quarrelsome stuff that he'll talk about in a moment. In other words, the youthful passions is a broader category. You know, and it doesn't only apply to young people, though of course T Timothy was relatively young, perhaps mid-30s. You can be older and still need to flee from youthful passions. What, what he's talking about is this desire to be the top dog, the selfish ambition, the self-assertion, this obstinacy, and resistance to correction. Flee that, Timothy, says Paul. Cleanse yourself from that. That's what the false teachers are like. Don't be like that. And then pursue, run after, be like Joseph in the Old Testament when he fled from Potiphar's wife's proposal to him. He just ran out the door, flee those youthful passions. Don't be self-assertive. Don't be selfishly ambitious. Don't be obstinate. Instead, pursue faith, love, peace along with those that is in the community of the church under the preaching of God's word in small groups and adult communities together in worship so that we clean the vessel of our lives so here we are in the house of God and we all want to live our lives as something significant how do we do that well says Paul you're a vessel the master has a condition, a clean vessel. Clean your life by the power of the resurrection. But, says Paul, in this great house, there's another picture I want you to have in your mind, Timothy. And that other picture, the, not just the, uh, the, uh, the inanimate object, the thing, the vessel, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an unlikely hero, the most unlikely hero that I want you to model your life after in this great house. And that unlikely hero is a servant. And if the, if the point of the vessel image is to be clean, the point of the servant image is to be humble, gentle, kind. So now, says, says Paul, Timothy, think in your mind about a servant in the house and think of how they act. And so he says, don't be quarrelsome. For you know, foolish and ignorant controversies do no good and they, they ruin people. Don't get involved with quarrels. Flee that kind of youthful passion. Don't get involved with quarrels. Now, what he's not saying is, Timothy, don't contend for the truth of the resurrection because the whole of this letter is urging Timothy to correct false teaching. And again, he'll say exactly that in the moment but don't be quarrelsome means choosing what kind of things to contend about and how to contend about them in other words as a good friend of mine in ministry would often tell me he would say Josh in church life the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing That's why we have as our masthead, our slogan, proclaiming the gospel as a church. We're going to keep the main thing the main thing, for that is the main thing to do. So when it comes to the resurrection, Timothy, yeah, you need to correct that false teaching. There's a lot of us, there's a lot of false teaching out there that we together need to correct. But don't, don't go too far, Timothy. Don't become quarrelsome. 
Don't start arguing about the color of the carpet or the, the, the style of the music or, or, or the, the things that people wear or, 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 or these secondary, even tertiary issues. Don't be quarrelsome about them. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. But it's also how you go about it, Timothy. And he has these four descriptions of how Timothy is to go about it. He he is to be gentle, or we might say kind. The word there for gentle is used by Paul in another letter to describe a mother, a nursing mother with her child. That's what you're to be like, Timothy. When you're correcting someone, you're like a a nursing mother with a child. You're kind. But not only that, Timothy, you need to be apt to teach, which goes back to this metaphor of the workman who's skilled. You need to know your stuff. That's why we as a church teach the Bible at every level from cradle through to grave, because we all need to know the Bible so that we can teach the Bible and correct in our minds and in other people's minds false understandings of false ideas. They're apt, able to teach skillfully. And then says Paul to Timothy, you need to be patient with evil. Now that doesn't mean not correcting this false teaching about the resurrection. What it means is, Timothy, you just need to put up with annoyances, difficulties, troubles, people who attack you. Just let that roll off your back and just be patient. Have a long fuse. Don't suddenly light up and get quarrelsome. Be patient with evil. And then uh, says uh, Paul to Timothy, you need to be gentle. Or the word there could also be put as humble, mild, meek. So, Timothy, I'm giving you a big job in your life uh, with your family, with your church, with your business. You have this big job, and you may not feel adequate to it, but there's a way you can go about it. Imagine you're in a great house, and if you cleanse yourself from dishonorable purposes, then you'll be a vessel the master will inhabit and use. You can do that, Timothy. What is more, if you go into that great house, you'll see there are servants, and actually, Timothy, kind of people that God really uses, and this is so different from the sort of myth in our culture of the leader, the big macho leader. No, says Paul, the person that God uses is the humble, kind servant. Be like that, Timothy. Be like that. You say, well, why does that matter? What, what, the reason why it matters, and now Paul, as it were, pulls back the drapes or pulls back the curtains of the, the, the physical to the spiritual dynamics at work. It matters because God might grant them repentance to a knowledge of the truth. It's his work. He's got to do it. You've got to be a vessel that he can inhabit. You've got to be a servant for the master. It's his work, not yours, Timothy. And what is more, there is a spiritual dynamic of the devil, the enemy. And Paul pictures the devil like a hunter going around trying to trap people, put out traps or snares, laying them around so that they step into them, they get trapped, like they're now wrong about the resurrection or they're getting into youthful passions and whatever. And so, Timothy, you've got to come alongside someone who gets trapped like that is in a snare and you've got to come alongside them and gently say you know maybe you need to rethink this resurrection thing maybe you need to rethink these youthful passions let me help you get out of this trap and so they can be freed so here we are in the great house the house of God and you Timothy you have a task We're in a a time and a day when there is pressure on Christians and pressure on Christianity. 
How can you be the kind of person who's a light for Jesus at work, at home, at world, and in the church? Well, says Paul, you've got to first clean yourself from this false teaching, this false living. For the master has one condition for the vessels that he wants to use, and that is that they're clean. And then says Paul to Timothy, you need to be a kind, humble servant. That's the kind of person God uses. You know, it was Chris Austin, the great ancient preacher Chris Austin, who one time was uh, preaching to his congregation, and he described the church like this. He said, the church is a fortress against the devil. Here we are in the great house of God, and what we need in order to be used by God as we gather as the church and then as we scatter as the church to our homes and families and businesses is to be vessels that are clean and servants that are gentle and kind. Let's pray together. Our Lord God, we do ask I ask that you would equip us all, that you would empower us all to be this kind of vessel, this kind of servant. Would you, by your resurrection power, clean up our lives, our thinking? Would you give us fresh discipline to be vessels that are clean. And Father, would you help us to be servants, not quarrelsome, not arguing about secondary, tertiary issues, but focused on you and the gospel and contending for the resurrection power of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that uh, as we leave here today and go to our homes and families and then tomorrow to work, you would help us to be clean vessels and humble, humble servants so that you, Lord, the master, the master of the house could use us for great things. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.